Welcome to the Common Sense Cat Care Video Series. My name is Pat Cansor, and for the last 14 years, I've been involved with various areas of cat care. When I first started out, less than half of the household pets were cats. The latest figures show that over 62% of companion animals in the household are felines. There are many reasons for this. Mostly, cats are very easy pets to have. But easy doesn't mean that there's no work at all. It's true that you don't have to walk a cat, but you do have to change their litter. You have to pay attention to some of their behavior patterns. You should perhaps give some thought to what you're going to feed them. And there are certain grooming and bathing procedures that you might want to consider. In this video series, we will cover all of these areas. But be aware that this video series is not intended to take the place of veterinarian services. These videos are for educational purposes. If you have any question whatsoever about your pet's health, consult with your veterinarian or animal health care professional. This is volume one of the Common Sense Cat Care series, Bathing and Grooming Your Cat. When this tape is over, you will know why it's important to groom and bathe your cat, the equipment you'll need, how to cut your cat's claws, how to comb or brush your cat, how to clean your cat's ears, how to clean your cat's teeth, how to bathe your cat, and how to dry your cat. Let's take a look at why it's important to groom and bathe your cat. If you're like me, you probably grew up thinking, why should I bother bathing a cat or grooming a cat? Don't they always bathe themselves? Aren't they constantly grooming? Well, yes. But what they're doing while they're grooming is they're ingesting hair. And that's not good for the cat. So what you want to do when you're grooming your cat is to get rid of that excess hair. Now, if your cats are anything like mine, they are constantly shedding. And there are any number of reasons why a cat might shed. First of all, it could be the season of the year. Normally, cats will shed in late fall and in early spring. This is what happens in the wild. But we've had cats living in our houses. They live with artificial heat in the wintertime and artificial air conditioning in the summertime. And what we've done is we've confused them so they're constantly in a, in a shedding situation. The second reason that cats shed is stress. Now, what's a stress situation for a cat? If you're a cat owner, you know almost anything will stress a cat. It could be workmen in the house. It could be that there's a new baby in the house. It could be that you're going on vacation. It could be that the cat is going to the vet. For whatever reason, that cat is shedding. And by your grooming that cat, you're going to cut down on the problems that that shedding will cause. Since cats are constantly licking themselves, they are producing a protein, an enzyme, that ends up as cat dander on the surface of the cat. If you've ever had anyone in your family, or if you yourself are allergic, or say you're allergic to cats, what you are allergic to is cat dander. And by properly grooming and bathing your cat, you'll eliminate this problem. Another thing that happens when cats groom themselves is they swallow their hair. Now, this could lead to one of three outcomes. Number one, if you're lucky, the hair goes through the cat and you don't have to deal with it at all. Number two, the cat swallows the hair and then generally leaves you a little cylindrical present somewhere on the rug, usually in the middle of the night. The solution to this can either be never feed the cat anything that's not the same color as the rug or groom your cat. The third thing that can happen when cats swallow their hair is very unfortunate. 
it can form an impaction inside their intestines. And that means a trip to the vet, a big bill for you, and a lot of discomfort for your cat. So, at this point, let's go and see what equipment you're going to need to groom and bathe your cat. Now let's take a look at the equipment that we're going to need. Not only to groom the cat, but also to bathe the cat. And probably the most important thing to realize is that you want to get all of your things together before you pick up the cat. Because the last thing that you're going to want to do is have one angry kitty under your arm while you're looking for your comb or the shampoo. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is cat claw clippers. These are specifically designed to cleanly cut a cat's claws. Now, it's true you can use a clipper designed for dog claws. You could even use fingernail cutters that you use on yourself. But these clippers are designed to do the best job on your cat's claws. Another thing that you're going to need is a flea comb. Now, flea combs come in many sizes, colors, and configurations, but they all have one thing in common, and that is that the teeth are very close together. There's a reason for this. When you draw this comb through your cat's fur, the fleas are trapped between the tines of the teeth of the comb, and therefore you can get rid of them. It's natural flea control. If you have a long-haired kitty, you're going to need a comb. Now this one is designed so that the teeth are closer together on this side and wider apart over here. This is useful because the wide teeth are good for when you're just starting out and you're trying to get the fur combed. Once you get through the cat's fur a little bit, then you can switch to the teeth that are closer together. If you have a short-haired cat, you're going to want to have what's known as a slicker brush. Now a slicker brush is a handle with a base and a bunch of very fine wires that are slightly bent, set into a foam backing. The reason that this is designed this way is to simulate the cat's tongue as it cleans its own fur. You're going to want to have some vitamin E capsules. The reason for this is if you should need to clean the cat's ears, you're going to want to use the wheat germ oil that the vitamin E capsules are filled with. Now, you may have heard that you can use hydrogen peroxide or rubbing alcohol to clean a cat's ears. And you can, but I prefer to use the vitamin E and wheat germ oil because I don't like to put anything on a cat that I would feel badly if it got into the cat. You're going to want to have some cotton-tipped swabs. These are useful not only for cleaning the cat's ears, but also for cleaning the cat's teeth. As far as bathing equipment is concerned, you're going to want to have some type of a hose that fits over the faucet and acts as a shower. This is to wet the cat before you shampoo it. You're going to want to have a sponge this is better than pouring the shampoo all over the cat's head. It makes for a happier kitty. You're going to want to choose a puppy and kitten safe shampoo. There are any number of good ones out there. I particularly like some products from a company called Esprit that's down in Dallas, Texas. As long as it says kitten and puppy safe, you'll be okay. And you will want some type of a dryer. This one is specifically designed for use with pets. It has a number of speeds and a number of temperature settings. And you will want four or five fluffy towels. You may not use them all, but you'll certainly be happy to have them if you should need them. Clipping a cat's claws is probably one of the more difficult endeavors that you're going to have 
in cat care. Cats don't like to have their claws clipped. They will fight you. But it's important that we take those sharp claws away from the kitty, not only for her sake, but also for ours. Because if you're going to do any other grooming, you're going to want to make sure that your cat is not going to inadvertently hurt you. So Susie and I are going to give Susie a pedicure. Susie, are we going to cooperate here? We're just going to lay you back like this and hold on to the paw and put your thumb above the claw and your index finger on the pad and push down and this will extend the claw. You pick up your clipper and you clip the claw. Okay. You press on the pad of the foot and clip at the curve of the nail. You want to be very careful, good kitty, that you don't clip too far down because there's a vein that runs inside that claw and that would hurt the kitty if you were to clip that vein. So you want to be very careful. Press on the top and the pad and clip. Good cat. Press on the top and clip. Press on the top and clip. One thing to remember when clipping cat's claws is that neatness doesn't really count and you don't have to finish. This is a stressful activity for the cat. So especially in the beginning, if you can get one or two or maybe even three claws, you and your cat have done very well. Eventually, your cat will get used to you working on his or her feet and might even come to enjoy it. So take your time, don't stress yourself, and don't stress the cat too much. Cleaning a cat's ears is one of those things where you don't do it each time, but you should know how to do it sometimes because every once in a while you run across a problem with a cat's ears. Cat's ears are very sensitive. So what you're going to want to do first is bend the ear leather back and look inside. What you're looking for are dark brown patches, anything that seems to be moving in there which would indicate some type of parasite and requires a trip to the vet. If you find anything like that, you're going, going to want to clean that out. And to do that, you would use a cotton swab dipped in vitamin E oil. Now you want to be careful so that you don't go any further into the ear, but where you can easily see. The reason for this is that there are some very sensitive parts of a cat's ears and you don't want to damage those ears. Good kitty, Susie. Another area that needs to be checked is a cat's teeth. Most cats don't really appreciate your poking around in their mouth. But again, it's one of those things that's important. Cats, just like people, suffer from periodontal disease. What this means is that the cat could suffer from heart failure, a systemic infection, and this is easily prevented by inspecting and brushing your cat's teeth. Now, you don't need to go out and buy a kitty toothbrush, and you certainly don't want to go sticking your fingers in the cat's mouth because likely as not, cat will think that you are feeding him a new kind of lunch. What you do want to do is you want to take the cat the cat's head and lift the upper lip and look at the gum line right in here just above where the teeth come out of the gums. What you're looking for are nice pink gums. If the gums are white that indicates a medical problem that you're going to want to see your vet about. If like with this kitty you see some red, you're going to want to take 
a cotton swab that's been dipped in hydrogen peroxide, starting up on the gum line and come down the tooth, like so. Okay. Move back, lift the lip, and come down the gum. In doing this, good kitty Susie, you are removing the plaque that causes periodontal disease and other diseases in your cat. Susie isn't used to this procedure, and yet she tolerated it very well. Your cat and your mileage may vary. Grooming a short-haired cat is something that really takes a little bit of practice, but is not all that difficult. Susie, I hope you're going to cooperate with me. When you groom a short-haired cat, you want to use a slicker brush. And there's a certain order that you want to brush the cat in. There's a reason for this. You start out brushing behind the cat's head and along the neck. Almost all cats enjoy this. And what you're doing here is you are simulating the cat grooming itself. The slicker brush in this case feels very much like the cat's own tongue. And what you're doing is pulling out all of the loose hair, loosening the dander, loosening the dead skin in preparation for the bath. The next area that you're going to want to use the slicker brush on is between the front legs. Good girl, Susie. And again, you're going to want to do this gently, short strokes, and then go back to the area behind the neck. Susie, where are you going? Come on, honey, we've got to go over here. There you go. Next, you want to start grooming the thighs. Now, there's a good way to hold the cat while doing this. You come up underneath the cat and put your hand with your fingers on either side of the cat's neck. This stretches out the back leg, and you can do the thigh and the belly. Switching hands, you do the other side. Short-haired cats are pretty easy to groom. Finally, you're going to want to do the back and the tail. Now, most cats tend to move around a bit, especially if you're messing around their tail. So you're going to want to learn a technique called the scruff. If you've ever seen a mama cat carrying her kittens around, you really already know how to do the scruff. You grasp the cat by that loose flap of skin at the back of the neck, and hold firmly. You don't hold, hurt the kitty, but you're just holding her firmly. Then you can pick up your slicker brush and start brushing down the back and at the base of the tail. This would be a good time to check for fleas. It's always good to have your flea comb handy and one of the places that fleas like to hide is at the base of the tail. So taking the flea comb, you start drawing it through the fur, like so. And you're going to get a lot of matter. I'm going to put it right down here on the table so that you can see it. You're going to get a lot of loose hair and matter that comes out of the flea comb at this point. Now you're going to want to pay particular attention to what's in that clump that came out of the cat on the flea comb. What you're looking for is, first of all, live fleas. If it moves, it's probably a flea. Or what's called flea dirt. This can be kind of a brownish, powdery substance, and that's actually dried blood from 
what the flea has ingested and passed through its body. Now, I'm looking pretty closely at this, and although Susie has quite a bit of dander, she doesn't appear to have any fleas. One way that you know whether or not you have really groomed your kitty well is if you can take the flea comb and run it through the coat completely. This pulls out all of that really extraneous and tough to get at loose hair. And if you've done the job well, you won't run into any glitches or snags. One point that I might want to make here, a caution, and that is that you've probably noticed that the cat's skin moves around quite freely on the cat. This is because cat skin is not firmly attached to the muscle underneath. And for that reason, and also because cat skin is very thin and very fragile, if you should happen to inadvertently catch the cat's skin with the teeth of your comb or with a sharp instrument, cat skin doesn't cut, cat skin tears. And that would be very, very hard on your kitty. Thank you, Susie, you were a very good girl. Grooming a long-haired cat is very similar to grooming a short-haired cat, but there are certain important differences. First of all, when grooming a long-haired cat, you're going to use a comb rather than a slicker brush. Bogey doesn't particularly care for this, so we're going to do this a little bit quicker than we might normally do it. You start again at the back of the neck with the widest teeth that you have available. When you feel pulling, like I'm feeling here, you go very gently because this means that there's a mat in there and that if you keep pulling that you're going to hurt him. So you go very slowly starting with the back of the neck, okay? Scruffing him. I know, Bogey, this is an affront to your dignity, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yes, I know. And there's that big mat right there. If you can see that, that's with long-haired cats, very prevalent. That is a mat. And you want to start out kind of picking at it from different ways, taking your time, and sometimes they'll come out very easily. Continuing. Again, remembering that cat skin is very tender and very sensitive. So you don't want to angle the teeth of the comb. You want to keep, yeah, I know, Bogey. Yes. You want to keep the teeth of the comb perpendicular to the cat's skin. Oh, we have another one there. Okay. So you just kind of take your time picking at it. There is no prize for neatness. And if it gets too stressful on the cat, Go on to another area. Oh, I know, yes. Yes, okay. We'll try it just a couple more times and we'll go on to another spot. How's that, okay? Sometimes you turn the comb around, get a little finer tooth. Whoop, 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 whoop. Okay, okay. I know, yes, okay. When it gets too tough in one area, go on somewhere else. Bogey or any other cat will let you know if you're stressing him out. Starting on the sides. See, this is good stuff. Yes, and you're going to be so gorgeous. Coming down the sides. When you're working with the comb, you want, when you're working with the comb, you want to be very careful of the cat's bones. It's very uncomfortable to be bumping the teeth of the comb along the spine just as it would be uncomfortable for you. Yes, I know, horrible, horrible affront to your dignity. Again, you want to use the flea comb in the areas where you think you might find fleas. 
Bogey has been known on occasion to have a flea or two, so we're going to check him pretty well. And Bogey's not a happy camper right now. No fleas, Bogey. That's good news. And we'll go back to grooming with the comb. And in a little while, we'll have him all combed out. How many times have you said to yourself, I can't comb that cat. That cat's not going to let me comb that cat. The hardest part of combing a long-haired cat is the underside, the belly. I'm going to show you a couple of things that you can try. Again, try. They don't always work. Not all cats will cooperate with you. But most of the time, if you take your time and you show the cat that you're really not out to hurt them but to help them, they might complain, but they will cooperate. We have Whitey here. And Whitey, we're going to lay you down like this, OK? And we're going to take our comb. And you'll notice that we have her scruffed back here. You remember how I told you about scruffing a cat? This is very important because when you're combing out under here, this is very sensitive. And you don't want the cat moving around a lot. That's a good girl. Good girl, Whitey. Yes. And so, by scruffing her, you are more or less immobilizing her. Let's get that tail out of the way. Good girl. So that you can get that underside combed out. You want to be, again, very careful around the tail. Yeah, I know. Good girl. And in the bloomers. OK. And while you've got her in this position, as long as she's cooperating, keep her scruffed. And this way you can get under the chin. Good girl, Whitey. Yes. Being very careful of the areas under the arms. Yes, good girl, yes. Oh, yeah, I know. It's an affront to your dignity. Mm-hmm. She did very well. And again, if you remember to hold on to the scruff, and you're careful and gentle, I know, Whitey, and take your time, you'll be able to get that done. Once you've got all of your bathing equipment ready, it's time to bring in the cat. Now, most people think that cats are afraid of water. What cats are afraid of is drowning. So you don't want to let them see water coming at them. Gently but firmly, scruff the cat. You've already got your water started. Make sure that it's warm. And you start by wetting the rear thigh of the cat. Good girl. Very good girl. Being very careful not to get water up into the cat's face or her ears. Wet the back end of the cat first. Good girl, Susie. One thing that you do need to do is learn how to work one-handed. Good girl. This is warm. It feels good. Yes. Very good. Make sure that the cat is well wet, wetted down. Yes, good girl. OK. Good girl. Good girl. Once the cat is completely wet, oh, we need a little more back here. There you go. Then it's time to start the shampoo. Again, starting at the back end, apply the shampoo and rub it in. A trick that professional groomers use is to save dishwashing liquid bottles or shampoo bottles once they're empty. Then you can mix your shampoo in the bottle 
and it makes it very easy to work one-handed. Good girl. You want to make sure that you work the shampoo into the fur. You may not get a very big amount of lather. That's okay. You just want to make sure that the kitty is getting cleaned. Come on, girl. There we go. Get the back. Get the paws. Lift the kitty up. A little squirt on the belly. Back feet. There we go. Tail. And make sure that you get the part that went over the fence last. Yeah, I know. Yes. Right. Once you have the cat's body fully soaped up, you use your sponge and get the head, keeping the soap out of the cat's eyes, like so. Good girl, Susie. Good girl. Good kitty. Yeah. Now, you want to rinse the cat. And the idea is to work the rinse water completely through the coat because you want to thoroughly rinse the soap out of the cat's fur. The reason for this is because, whoops, come back here, girl. If you leave soap in the fur, it will irritate the skin, cause itching, and could cause sores. Yes, this is nice and warm. Yes, it is. Come here. Come on, girl. Good girl. Good Susie. Now, if you were treating Susie for fleas, Instead of rinsing the shampoo out immediately after working it into the fur, you would let it sit for at least 15 minutes. The reason for this is that fleas have what's called an exoskeleton, kind of a hard shell on the outside. And by letting the shampoo any shampoo, it does not have to be a special flea shampoo, sit on the cat for a minimum of 15 minutes. Come on, girl. There we go. Good girl. You dissolve the exoskeleton of the flea and kill them. Okay. Once you're sure, yes, I know, Susie. Once you're sure that you have completely rinsed all of the soap out of the kitty's fur, yes, I know, you want to make sure that you gently clean out the corners of the eyes to make sure that you get any little sleepers or matter out of there. Then you can turn off the water and gently squeeze as much of the water out of the cat's fur as possible. There we go. Like so. And have your dry towel ready. Wrap the cat in the towel. And now we're ready to dry. Well, Susie's bath is finished, and now it's time to dry her off. You want to take as much of the water out of the coat as you can with the dry towel. Rub her down. This will also tend to calm her a little bit, because the next thing you're going to do is use a dryer. 
on the kitty. And dryers make a noise very much to a cat, like a vacuum cleaner. And most cats don't like the sound of a vacuum cleaner. So when you've got as much of the water out of the cat's coat as possible with the towel, you introduce the dryer. Now, some cats will get very panicky when you first put on, turn on the dryer. So you want to make sure that you've got her scruffed. Start the dryer away from the cat and apply the dryer to the back end of the cat. This is going to do two things. First of all, it will get the cat used to the sound. And secondly, the cat will feel the warmth and that feels good to a cat. The idea is to keep the dryer moving because you don't want to hold it steady and burn the cat's skin. Keep the dryer moving, working around the back end of the cat, working the moisture out of the coat. Now, it really doesn't matter if you make straight line motions with the dryer, circular motions with the dryer, little patterns. The point is to separate the cat's fur and get the moisture out of the coat. From time to time, you'll want to stop, pick up your comb, and fluff the coat out. This is to remove any loose fur that might still be in the cat and give you better access down to the cat's skin where the moisture is generally held in the undercoat. Once you've finished with one side of the cat, or at least gotten it to where it's sort of dry, you're going to want to put the dryer down, change hands, and start drying on the other side of the cat. Again, starting with the back end. The same procedure is followed when moving up the cat. You want to make certain that you don't point the dryer nozzle directly into the cat's ears or directly into the cat's face. Cats don't like their faces blown into. It tends to make them very angry. To dry the underside of the cat, you're going to want to put her on her back. And again, keep the dryer moving. And you'll continue to do this until the cat is completely dried. Yes, that feels good. Now, Susie is almost dry, but in real time, it's about 20 minutes later. When you do this at home, depending on the length of hair that your cat has, it will take between 20 minutes to an hour to dry your cat. It's not really necessary to dry the cat absolutely, totally dry. A little dampness is okay. The important part is that if you are going to be doing this in the winter time, that you make sure that if you don't dry your cat completely, that you keep him or her out of drafts until they are dry. Susie's just about at the end of her bath and grooming, and we're just about at the end of this tape. Today, you've learned why it's important to groom and bathe your cat, what equipment you need, how to groom a short-haired and a long-haired cat, how to bathe a cat, how to dry a cat, how to cut a cat's claws, clean their ears, and clean their teeth. I'm Pat Cantor, and thank you for watching Common Sense Cat Care, Volume 1. And you were such a good girl.